John Wimber from the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Anaheim, California. We're here in the studio today studying the Word as it relates to healing for today. Our topic for today and for the next few weeks is healing in the New Testament. If you have your uh, brochures, I want you to turn to page one and we're going to start uh, with the topic of healing in the New Testament. The number of healings of individuals recorded in the Old Testament does not compare with the considerable number detailed in the New Testament. During his three-year ministry, Jesus healed many times the number that were healed during the preceding 2,000 years. With the coming of the Messiah, there was a gushing forth of the mercies of God. And with this, we notice that the sickness or health is no longer emphasized as a means of judgment for sin or reward for obedience. Rather, sickness is seen to be an extension and an effect of sin, and therefore it is evil in origin and is representation of the kingdom of darkness. We shall see that in the coming of Jesus, the kingdom of God came with great power to confront and overcome sickness, sin, death, and the devil. However, this does not negate the Old Testament concept of healing, but is rather a fuller rev revelation of God's unfolding plan. In reconciling the Old and New Testament concepts of healing, we can say that God is still over all. And even the devil is ultimately under God's control, being his agent at times, although God himself does not tempt anyone with evil. Disobedience and sin open us up to weakness, sickness, and death. But even this is a means of discipline so that we are not condemned with the world. Now, the major part of this section will deal with a study of the kingdom of God and healing and how they're integrated. But before we examine that, we must first have some basic background to the New Testament. And so let's look today at an approach to understanding the New Testament. First of all, it's important to recognize that there's a basic dualistic framework in the Bible. That is to say, in the New Testament, there is a relationship between this age and the age to come. We need to have a right understanding of what it is saying. The Old Testament describes God's dealings with Israel in this life with an ever-increasing prophetic hope that a day will come when God as King will personally pay His people a visit. This is uh, scripture like the day of the Lord as referenced in Malachi, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 6. And then a new age of life will begin. The basic framework of two ages begins to emerge as it's formed in the Old Testament. This present age and yet the age to come. From the time of Daniel through the intertestamental times in the New Testament, the terms kingdom and kingdom of God become more and more prolific, having derived its meaning from the monarchy. Thus, Daniel, for example, sees the two ages in terms of kingdoms when interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Quote, In the time of the kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all of those kingdoms and bring to an end, but it will itself endure forever. If you want to read that text, you can look in Daniel, the second chapter, verses 31 through 45. Now, we must be aware that in the Old Testament, we have two themes as it relates to this business of the age that's to come and as, the, as it relates to the idea of the kingdom coming on earth in the form of the work of the Messiah. First, we have this view that we just call a reference called the Danielic view, in which we see the kingdom as an internal kingdom and a spiritual kingdom. But a second, probably more prominent view was what would be referenced as the Davidic view. Remember, under King David, Israel sort of peaked out. It reached its utopia. Under the ministry of David and under the work of David's monarchy, the, the kingdom reached its zenith. It had its greatest economic uh, blessing. It had its greatest growth in terms of numbers. It uh, conquered its enemies, you know, almost at will. Uh, during uh, David's time and from that time forward, the kingdom, though, began descending. That is to say, immediately after David, we have the division of the, the 12 tribes and the division, uh, ultimately, of the kingdom. From that time forth, uh, uh, Israel lost its prominence and position uh, in the Middle East. Until uh, such a time as that uh, the uh, Lord Jesus came, the uh, people had developed a mentality in which they looked back uh, sort of uh, under the uh, of his, uh, look at, at Israel as though this was the good old days, you know. And, and by the time Jesus came and he emerged on the scene, the people uh, were very fond of looking back at the uh, reign of David and uh, and and wishing, you know, a hope had built up in in society for the reestablishing of the uh, the pinnacle, the the zenith of, the, of their uh, and preeminence of their uh, country, and so. This was a well-established understanding in the minds 
uh, of the people. Have you ever noticed that the uh, apostles kind of come off like the three stooges about half the time? Uh, I know, you know, they, they don't understand what the teaching's about. They don't understand the purpose of Jesus. They don't understand his, his works, his miracles. They're in constant dialogue with each other. Uh, you know, what did he mean? What did he say? What did he do? One time they thought they'd forgotten their bread. Remember, they got really confused over that. And Jesus finally had to say, listen, fellas, I'm talking about uh, the pride of the, of the Pharisees. I'm not talking about bread. And so there were many occasions in which the, the uh, apostles were put in a, in a situation where they just didn't grasp what was going on. Well, the problem was they had fixed in their mind that with the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, that he would take over in a political reality. This is why again and again, remember uh, one of the, uh, two of the brothers, their mother came to Jesus and wanted to get him a special place, you know, Jewish mothers. And uh, she, she came and she wanted to negotiate a deal for her sons. And Jesus said, look, it's not mine to give. And so there was constant tension. And the problem was that they had fixed in their mind the idea that when Messiah came, there would be a political uh, reestablishment of the country. They'd run off the Roman occupation. They would take over. And even after Jesus' arrest, uh, trial, mock trial, series of trials, and death, uh, and uh, reappearance, and ministry to them, on the, on the last day before Jesus ascended, while he was uh, on the Mount of Olives, they turned to him. Remember in the first chapter of Acts, it said, Will you at this time establish, give the, the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, <laughs> No, and, and left, remember? And I, the reason I'm pointing this out is because, you know, you see an, an interpretation, a paradigm, a viewpoint can become so fixed in your mind that you can't see the truth that's obvious. Jesus had been teaching them about the spiritual kingdom. Jesus had been communicating the nature of, of his ministry and what he was going to do, but they were so fixed, they had already bought their condos in Jerusalem. They, they were they had, they had already you know figured out where, where they were going to didn't they in their minds they had already figured out their positions a right hand left hand you know who, who's going to be in the cabinet what's going to happen they had really perceived that Jesus was going to take over politically and so this was a an, an ongoing tension in the minds of the apostles and it caused them to misinterpret much about the first coming of Jesus and that's why it's so sensitive today that we have a, a theology that embraces all the biblical revelation when it comes to the second coming. Could it be that we could make the same mistake that they made over different issues? Could we get so fixed on the coming of Jesus from a certain paradigm, a certain viewpoint, that we missed him when he comes the second time? That we'd misunderstand the nature of his coming, the work of his coming? Now, that, that's another topic for another time. But my point is, is that the apostles were in a learning situation. From day one with Jesus, they were learning new truths, new realities, new uh, dynamics, new skills. Uh, they were in a, in a learning climate, weren't they? And so this business of ministering to the sick is something that, that stretches the imagination. It, it'll, it'll pull you into new arenas. It'll cause you to take risks and cause you to, to operate in faith in such a way as that uh, it'll challenge your socks off trying to pray for the sick effectively. And it certainly did the apostles. They had to learn to heal. Now, with that, I want to pick up back with the text and deal with some other aspects of the kingdom. But it's important to recognize that the apostles almost misunderstood entirely what Jesus was about doing when he came the first time. Because they were so fixed on their perception of what he ought to be doing. Okay? Now, in the text, we deal with another aspect of this coming of Jesus. With the rise of the concept of God's kingdom ushering in a new age, there was also the rise of the awareness of the devil and his deeds, the cataclysmic clash between light and darkness, God's inter, uh, interruption of history with his victory over Satan and his hordes. Now remember, in the Old Testament, Satan's a shadowy figure. We really only have three uh, major sections of Scripture even devoted to his work other than the uh, book uh, of Job. And... And all of that has, requires interpretation uh, in order to even grasp the, who he is. You know, in, in the, uh, for instance, in the garden, it doesn't say Satan. It says a serpent. And so we have to interpret that as Satan. Uh, in the Ezekiel reference that's so commonly used, it, again, 
uh, we have to interpret it because we're, we're talking about the king of Tyre there. And so we have to strain some of these texts to even get a perception of who he is and how he works in the Old Testament. He's not that visible. Now, I have a theory. I believe that, because, that until the Messiah came, that the full impact of God's light was not in the world. He was the light. And with the light, darkness was shown up. And so it remains for the intertestamental period before Satan really becomes pr prominent and visible in the world. In, in, the, in your text, it says there was a this was especially prominent in the so-called apocalyptic lit uh, literature. Jesus, uh, Jewish writings between 200 and 100 B.C. having a particular revelatory character which provided a development of thought for the New Testament. For instance, in Enoch 1.9, it, this describes the solution of the problem of evil is when the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly. And this is echoed, of course, in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. And so we see in, uh, in, uh, in the coming of Jesus and the, the light of God coming into the world uh, incarnate that the, it exposed the underlying darkness. And with that, Satan becomes uh, prominent. He, he emerges as the uh, archenemy of Jesus. We see him battling with Jesus. We see him attacking Jesus uh, through the temptation. We see his minions, the, the demons, uh, controlling individuals and interacting. And, and so we have a, a, a cosmic awareness in the New Testament on, on, on what we might call an empirical plane. Uh, here are people operating, but there's, there's angelic visitations, there's demonic presence, there's an awareness of a backdrop of satanic involvement that's, that's not as visible in the Old Testament. So with the coming of Jesus, we have a, a new worldview, a new perception, don't we? And uh, with that, we understand the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, by way of definition, is the dynamic reign of God, the assertion of God's authority over the evil one and his deeds. You see, what we have here is power encounter. The power of two kingdoms. Uh, Jesus representing the kingdom of God and Satan representing his own kingdom of this world. And there's, there's encounter going on. You see, uh, Jesus comes and, and he drives out demons. He saves the lost. He heals the sick. He ministers uh, powerfully over nature. He demonstrates in every way that he represents the Father and that we, in the Father that he and, one, uh, and the Father are one and that he has great authority over all the works of the Father's hand. Whereas on the other hand, uh, Satan has done his work. He's gained his uh, uh, control uh, over the turf, so to speak, of the earth. He's gained his control over the people and he's, and he's caused them to come under his captivity and he's, he's worked his works upon them. And so wherever Jesus comes into contact with the enemy, and his work, there, there's power encountered. Two kingdoms opposed. In the New Testament, the dualistic framework of this present evil age, Galatians 1.4, and the age to come, Ephesians 1.21, is established, but in a new way. The New Testament teaches that in the coming of Jesus Christ, the future age has come into the present. The kingdom of God has been fulfilled, but not yet consummated. Thus, it is both present and future. We are part of the already and the not yet. We therefore are constantly living in what might be thought of as eschatological tension, meaning to say that we are at this time and place, but we are also aware of that that's yet to come. And so uh, we live uh, in a frame of reference where we're the citizens of two kingdoms. We, we're the citizens of this earth and of, of this country, for instance, but we're also heavenly citizens. And so there, sometimes we're, you know, you've, you've been caught in that tension before where the ethics and the laws of one kingdom are impugned by the ethics and laws of another kingdom. You know, the, the world says it's okay for you to do thus and so, but God says, uh-uh. And so your, your dual citizenship comes into tension. Well, it, the, the same is true with every aspect of our Christian lives. We live in a, an already and a not yet existence. There are a number of scriptures referenced in the New Testament that illustrate the issue of the kingdom. And here's just a few. For instance, in Mark 1.15, we have the concept that the time is fulfilled and that the kingdom of God is near. And yet, yet we also have in Matthew 12.28 that when the demons are driven out by God's Spirit, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the kingdom is both near and upon you. And yet in Luke 17.21, we see that the kingdom of God is among you or within you, as the reference says. 
in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, we had the idea that the fulfillment of the age has not yet come upon us. And yet, uh, in the, the same context, we have the perception that it has come upon us. You say, well, make up your mind. What does this all mean? All I'm trying to reference is the fact that there are, there are tensions in understanding this thing. In the uh, Hebrews 6, 5 reference, we, we demonstrate that we've, uh, the scripture demonstrates that we have tasted the powers of the coming age. Now, if you get a, a, a grasp of this, it'll help you understand the basic theology for healing. I think that heretofore we've had too simplistic a view of this whole business of healing. You know, this business of saying, well, this is what the word says and I claim it and then I believe it. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't even work for the people that are trying to work it. It isn't happening all that much. Now, you and I know that we've been praying for the sick in our fellowships for years. And, and uh, we don't heal everybody we pray for. But praise God, we're healing more than we used to. We're getting better at it. Well, what's the issue? Well, the issue is kingdom. You see, where the kingdom of God is being expressed, people are being healed. Where the kingdom of God is being expressed, people are being saved. Where the kingdom of God is being expressed, people are being delivered. Where the kingdom of God is being expressed, there's power over nature and the work uh, of the devil's hand. Where the kingdom of God is being expressed, the power of God is manifest. Now, where the kingdom of God isn't, none of those other things are happening. You want to know where God is? Where those things are happening. It's really just that simple. It's really just that uncomplicated. Where the kingdom of God is, God's will is being done. Isn't that what Jesus taught us to pray? Thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven. And so it's the will of God being expressed through the Son in the, the totality of the kingdom that we're dealing with. And I, my perception is that it's God's will to bless. It's God's will to heal. It's God's will to save. It's God's will to deliver. It's God's will to minister. But sometimes God's will is thwarted by unbelief. Remember the occasion where Jesus visited home the first time after his uh, uh, baptism in water and in the Spirit and his ministry had begun? He went home and the scripture says that he could do no mighty do deed there because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief curtailed his ministry. But then, of course, it says, but he healed a few. So you get the idea that healing is no big thing as compared to miracles, miracles over nature, for instance, or other kinds of miracles that he's done. But there is a, a correlation between belief, unbelief, some sort of an axis, and the fact that, uh, that, that works can be manifest. You see, unbelief can stop works from happening. And so it behooves us to become believers. Now, we all are, but we're like, like one other brother in the New Testament, we may have to pray, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help me grow in belief. Help me grow in my understanding of that that you want from me and that that you want to do in me. Now, the last point that I want to make today is to understand this, that the New Testament was written from this viewpoint, what we've just shared. The overlapping of two ages. God's kingdom had interrupted human history and was now spreading like leaven and growing like seed. This approach, in my opinion, helps us to have a correct understanding of healing in the New Testament. For instance, healing must, in my opinion, be interpreted in the light of the kingdom of God. Where God's will is being expressed, the kingdom is. Where God's kingdom is being expressed, healing is. Where God's kingdom is not being expressed, there's an absence of healing. And so we need to learn to, to operate in the kingdom reality, in the kingdom presence, in the kingdom privilege, in the kingdom power. And so my prayer for you and I, and for those that are viewing us today, is that all of those things would become a reality in our lives. That we would become a people of privilege and power. We'd become a people of purpose. That we'd learn how to move and operate in the dynamic of God's presence wherever we went. That like Jesus, we could say, I only do what I see the Father doing. Learning to minister in His power. Learning to do His works. Jesus said, I don't say anything that the Father doesn't give me to say. And I only do those things that the Father has given me to do. You agree? That's the kingdom. We've been talking today about kingdom healing.
and kingdom reality. And I thought that before we get very far in this process, that I'd talk to you a little bit about some basic things that we've learned about healing, and that is to say a basic structure or a basic guide that we follow. Now, we use five steps when we pray for the sick. And I thought I'd take a few moments today and share a little bit about those five steps because over the weeks we're going to be praying for the sick and I want you to be aware of them. The first step or, or the first stage, you can use stages or steps, whatever's comfortable for you, is what we call the interview. By that I mean we need to ask the people where does it hurt? Or where do you think it hurts? And what do you know about it? A lot of times they'll begin lapsing into medical language and we have to quickly tell them we're not physicians and we, it really doesn't help us to understand the medical aspects of it because we don't understand it if we understood it. But what we do do is we get a sense of where it hurts. And while we're operating, while we're talking, we're really operating on two planes. The first is what we would call the empirical plane. And by that I mean operating in our five senses. I'm looking at the person. You know, somebody wrote one time, it, sometimes it's more important to know what kind of bug or fella has a bug than what kind of bug has a fella. And all I'm trying to do is understand, who is this person I'm, I'm looking at? What, what, are they, what are they like? How do they perceive their illness or condition? What is their explanation of what's going on? What, what do they think it is? What is their understanding? At the same time that I'm gathering information through my five senses, I'm also sending up my antenna into the cosmic reality. I'm saying, Holy Spirit, show me your perception of this. Give me words of knowledge. Give me spiritual gifts that I might be able to bless this person and help them. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will give me an idea, a concept as I'm talking to them. And it helps me sort of cut through the red tape. And I know exactly what's wrong. But other times I don't get it. See, can you see that? Operating in two planes, the empirical and the cosmic. Asking for the gifts of the Spirit to help you. Now, I close the interview, stage one or step one, at the point where I have a sense that I've gathered all the information that's going to be helpful. Now, it may take a few minutes. It might be only a few seconds. It all depends on what God's doing in the process. If he doesn't help me much, it might take quite a while. And so I interview until I have a sense that I know what's wrong. Then I'm ready for the second stage or step, depending on how you're writing it down in your booklet. I, I'm, there, I'm, a, I'm ready now to make a basic, what I call, diagnostic decision. What do I think has caused this condition? Now, suppose they've been in an accident. I, I suppose that accident could either be caused by s something mechanically failing, uh, uh, something that has no force behind it, or it could even be caused by a spirit that's operating against this person. Uh, maybe they have a sickness. That sickness could either have uh, just be a malfunction of the body, or it could be directly related maybe to sin in their life. Uh, they've been sinning, and it's brought about this condition. Or it could be a spirit that's working against them. Or it could be some other means or situation. It might be social. They might be uh, sinning. They might have some anger uh, or hostility or unforgiveness in their heart and it's brought about this physical condition. And so I'm, I'm saying, Lord, show me what the nature of the condition is. When I have an inkling, then I'm ready to move to stage three, which is what I call the prayer stage. I'm, I'm ready now to select what kind of prayer approach I want. You know, I might, I might intercede for the person. Uh, I might uh, plead this person's condition or situation. Uh, I may just ask the Lord, uh, for, Lord, help us here. I don't, I don't fully understand what I'm seeing or experiencing or what this person's told me. I, we just I want you to come now, Lord, and help us, help us minister. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit may have, have uh, intervened and given me direct uh, revelation, and I know what's wrong, and I can sp pre uh, sp pray the prayer of command. Uh, sometimes you can pray uh, a, a prayer of uh, pronouncement, you know, just like Jesus did. Go, your, your faith has made you well. You're, you're, you've, you're, you're healed. But that can only come when the Spirit of God gives you the unction for that, you know. You, you pray that prayer when you haven't got that unction and look what happens. Nothing. You look, you look kind of foolish, huh? All right. I interview them. I diagnose. I select the prayer. Then I begin praying. Now, in my opinion, I think the best way to pray is to pray for effect. I, I always encourage people to keep their eyes open when we pray. And we look right at the person we're praying for. And sometimes I'll stop right in the middle of the prayer and say, How you, how's it going? Is there anything happening? Do you feel anything? You don't? Well, let's pray some more. And uh, maybe I'll restructure my prayer and, and pray another way. Uh, maybe the person does feel something. 
And uh, I'll say, you know, we're praying maybe for an arm. And I said, you feel anything? Well, I feel a little tingling, a little heat. I'll say, hot dog. Because tingling and heat usually means some healing is going on. And so I'll pray some more, pray enthusiastically. I, I find it a lot easier to pray enthusiastically when something's happening, don't you? <laughs> All right, so in that fourth stage, I'm praying for effect. I'm, I'm looking for something to happen. Now, the fifth stage is what I call the post-prayer directions or suggestions. Now, suppose that this condition has been brought about by sin in their life. Well, you'd say, go and sin no more. You know, maybe they have uh, uh, an ulcerate condition or uh, uh, some digestive problem or, there, or reoccurring headaches, and it's because they've had forgiveness in their heart towards somebody. And so you've taken them through forgiveness. They've received and released forgiveness for others. And now the condition is changing. The physical condition is changing. They're receiving healing. And you say, now, now don't harbor sin anymore. See, so at, you summarize with some direction, giving some suggestion. You interview them. You diagnose. You select your prayer. You begin praying. You pray for effect. And then you summarize based on your understanding of that that God may give you in the way of special instruction. You might send them to the pool of Siloam and tell them to wash. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> or something like that that God would give you. I'm John Wimber from the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Anaheim, California. We're in the studio here today studying the Word as it relates to the topic of healing for today. Last week we talked about healing in the New Testament, particularly as it relates to the idea of the Kingdom of God. Today I want to continue along those uh, general themes and address one of the aspects of the Kingdom of God as it relates to healing as wholeness of the total person and his environment. In the age to come, we shall be completely whole and a new, newly created environment. Remember in Revelation 21, 3 through 5, it says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so the word of God reveals to us there'll be a day when the kingdom coming into its complete fulfillment will be, have been established on earth even as it is in heaven. Another aspect of this business of healing as wholeness of the total person in his environment is that I want to remind you of is that in the coming of Jesus, this redemption into wholeness has already begun. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And so remember the tension that we talked about last week in which we dealt with the idea that, that in this present reality, we have this reality, but we also have a reality that's over and above this reality, which is that that is yet to come in the future. We live in two ages. We live in, in dynamic tension between two uh, conditions that are operating all the time, this present evil age and the age that's to come. That is to say, we live in the presence, but we also live in the presence of the future. God is on the move, and God has provided that dynamic through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, healing in the New Testament is the same Greek word, sozo, for salvation. 
which basically means saved, and I'm using a transliteration here, saved out from under the devil's power and restored into the wholeness of God's order and well-being by the power of God's Spirit. That's what we mean about reclaiming people out from under the kingdom of the devil and bringing them under the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ, Lord and Master of a new regime, a new kingdom, God's kingdom. Jesus taught us, remember last week we talked about this, pray, thy kingdom come, on, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what we're dealing with here is the bringing of that kingdom into this present reality. Now, Jesus Christ has provided us the, the ability, the power, and the authority to do so. This is what the Great Commission is all about. Therefore, healing or salvation is not only used in regard to physical or spiritual wholeness, but also for every other aspect of human life and environment. This is it that is in any way under the power of the influence of the devil. And so we are uh, constantly in the process of resting people, uh, rescuing people out from under the hand of the enemy. That's what uh, witnessing is all about. That's what healing is all about. That's what casting out demons is all about. That's what breaking the power of darkness and bondage over somebody is all about. You and I have been given the privilege then of uh, bringing victims, uh, the devil's victims, into wholeness and health and relationship with Jesus Christ. Healing uh, then is, uh, in this all-inclusive sense, uh, it has to do with the signs of the presence and the power of God's kingdom. Remember in Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 19 through 22, it says this, He sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Now remember, this is the inquiry of John the Baptist. You know, you would have probably done this too. If you would have been arrested and were looking at possibly dying, you might want to check your bases also. And so John wanted to make sure that what had been revealed to him supernaturally at the river was accurate, that this Jesus really was the Christ. And so he sent this group and he said, uh, Are you the one who is to come or should we look for, expect someone else? And when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And at that uh, time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, uh, evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. And so he turned to them and replied to the messengers and said this, Go back and report this to John what you've both seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. Now why didn't he just write out a creedal statement and send it back so that John could check out his orthodoxy? Because the issue here wasn't the teaching. The issue here was the demonstration. You want to know where the kingdom is? Where it's being demonstrated. You want to know where the king is, where the kingdom is, being demonstrated. Jesus Christ was demonstrating his Messiahship. Jesus Christ was working out in a practical uh, way the call of the Father on him as it directly related to the evidence of the kingdom in the world. He was about doing his Father's business. He was doing the Father's will. And so the kingdom is expressed as well as taught. We have both the word and the works. Now, another aspect of this business of the kingdom and the resting out of the, uh, uh, the hands of the enemy uh, is this whole issue of healing as deliverance from demonic power and influence. In the future age, there'll be no evil presence. Satan will be judged and driven out. Jesus has already fulfilled this in principle. Remember in the Gospel of John, verse 12, 31, it says this, Now is the time for judgment on this world, and now the prince of this world will be driven out. Jesus had come then to do battle. Jesus had come to drive out the enemy, to break his power the, of his hand, his, the stronghold of the enemy over others. He had come to pull him away, to drive him out, to push him out, and to break his power. Uh, every time that Jesus ran into anyone that had been victimized by the enemy, the demons shrieked in terror when they saw him. Their a typical response of the demons is, is this whole issue of, uh, of uh, in the confrontations, uh, they're, they're, they're crying out, as in Mark 1, 24, have you come to destroy us before the appointed time? Now, keep in mind, when, when we're dialoguing here, we're not dialoguing with Jesus 
uh, and the man were dialoguing with Jesus and demons that are in and upon the man. And the demons are shrieking when they come into Jesus' presence. Say, Have you come to drive? And the answer is, yes. I've come to break your power over this man. I've come to break your master's power over this man. And so wherever Jesus came into direct confrontation with the enemy's presence through demonization, the issue was the same. The demon shrieking, Jesus ministering, uh, speaking in power and authority. That's why the, uh, the attendants, the other uh, Jewish people watching uh, in attendance always said, my, he drives out demons with a word. They were used to the concept of uh, uh, d demon expulsing as it related to uh, what the, the rabbis did. Remember, the rabbis made their pocket money by driving out demons. But they didn't do it the same way that Jesus did. The way the rabbis did it was they, in effect, coaxed and incanted the demons out by using the sacred name of God. But Jesus never did that. Jesus came in power and authority, and he drove the demons out with a word. And, and by a, uh, de Jesus was a demon expulser. The rabbis were exorcists. Jesus never was an exorcist. He never performed any incanta incantations. He never did any rituals. He just spoke to those demons and told them to go. And that's why the people in attendance were so flabbergasted, dumbfounded by what they saw, because it, it so demonstrated this business of power encounter that we talked about last week. It was so clearly one kingdom coming against another kingdom. And you know, it's the same today. When you and I operate under the unction of God and the power of God, and we drive out demons, we are doing the very work that Jesus did, and he prophesied just that, didn't he? He said that we would do those works, and greater works. I'm looking forward to some of those greater works, aren't you? So Jesus was, as the kids say, a demon duster. Uh, when he came into contact with those demons, it was out. He spoke to them. He drove them out with a word. Now, so the expulsion of demons is the most uh, direct and dramatic form of confrontation between the two kingdoms. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 28, But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. See what we're talking about? God's reign, God's rule has come upon this situation, this poor person that has heretofore been victimized by the enemy. Now, the enemy's reign was on that person. The enemy's kingdom was being expressed on that person. And then Jesus came and drove the demons out, and now God's reign is being expressed upon that person. Can you see it? It's, it's uh, driving out demons. However, healing in the kingdom of God is far broader than the driving out of demons. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and in 1 John 3, 8, it says this, He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God has appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And I would add, the devil's works. So whenever we're acting on behalf of the Father to, to uh, stamp out pornography, to deal with drugs in the community, to deal with excesses and abuses uh, of poverty in the community, whenever we're working in the Father's behalf, we are working on, uh, to destroy the works of the, of the devil. You see, these are the earmarks of the devil's uh, work in the community. When pornography is uh, rampant in the community, the enemy is gaining ground. When pornography has been driven out of the community, the Lord's kingdom is being manifest. See how clear it is? It's, it, it's in direct proportion to these evidences that we see the kingdom working. In Luke, the 11th chapter, verses 21 and 22, it says this, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man uh, trusted and divides up the spoils. This gives us an illustration uh, in three aspects. First of all, that Satan is the strong man of the house who is overcome, disarmed and destroyed by Jesus, who is the stronger of two strong men. Jesus came then to break the power of the enemy and to drive out his presence and his manifest uh, work in the community. Even when the disciples were sent out to drive out demons, Jesus saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. And this is recorded in Luke 10, 17. Now, keep in mind that the enemy's house is this present evil age. That's what Galatians 1, 4 is talking about. And so here's, here's the conflict between two strong men. 
Jesus and the devil. The devil, the usurper, has taken control and dominion of the earth as a result of the fall of Adam. Jesus has come, the last Adam, to, to, to reestablish God's dominion over the earth. He's in conflict then with Satan the usurper. Wherever he sees the usurper's work going on in the community, he comes and confronts it. That's what preaching the gospel is all about. That's what witnessing is all about. That's what healing is all about. That's what breaking bondage is all about. These are the activities by which we drive out the strong man. Now, Jesus has bound the strong man, and you and I have the privilege now of moving in his household and taking back the goods, the people that he's brought under dominion. And so we need to understand that our work is, is the mop-up work, the clean-up work after the fact. Jesus has broken the power of the strong man, demonstrated to the world what he is, and has given you and I the privilege now of moving into that household and taking back the things that he's wrongfully taken. Got it? Go like that. That's a good class. Now, his goods then are men and women, each one under uh, the d devil's power and influence in varying degrees. Now, this degree could be uh, minimal and it could be maximum. It could be anything from uh, uh, the, the general sense that in the community we are resistant to the work and the words of God. And it could be as specific and as powerful as someone fully demonized, fully controlled by demonic power. Now, for years, like many Christians, I thought all the demons in the world were in Africa. You know, that's where I heard the stories. I didn't realize that some of them were here in the United States and that they were doing work. Now, keep in mind that demons that were alive in Jesus' day are the same demons that are alive today. Have you ever thought about that? Sometime we'll do a course on that subject. But it's important to recognize these guys have been around for a while and they've had some experience. They're fairly good at what they do. And the main thing they do is deceive. You see, the ultimate deception of the devil is when you don't believe he exists. He's really done his job when he's accomplished that. He's really completed his task when he's got you and I to the point where we don't believe he exists and we don't recognize his minions, his workers, work in the world. And the church, by and large, today in America has come to that place. We have very little perception of the enemy. Very, oh, you know, I, probably the most powerful concept of spiritual warfare that most of us has the whole idea of driving the church in the rain. You know, we really think we're under it then. Or a flat tire on the freeway. Now the devil's really working there. Well, I want to tell you something. The main work he does is in the controlling of men's minds. You see, when he can cause you to doubt the Word of God, you know, you read the Word and the Word says, thus and so, and then what's the enemy say? Has God said? You know that one? That's what he said to Adam, wasn't it? Well, he says the same thing. He said, oh, God knows that you're, you know, I mean, you're just, you've got to get through this life, you know. I mean, after all, uh, income tax people, you know, what, what does it mean? I mean, they, they abuse their positions and privilege. It doesn't matter that little bit of money that you did thus and so with, you know, that you're not putting down on the form. You know that one? Who do you think is guiding you to do that? That's the enemy. You say, well, you know, they, they never caught me. What do you mean they ever caught you? Most of us have been inundated by doing those little, you know, things. I mean, that's not a little thing. That's breaking a federal law. But we've, we've done those things that, that we, in a sense, never got caught. But you know something? We got caught every time. Because every time you did it, the enemy put that shame on you. And then, then what? You've got no testimony. You've got no witness. You've got nothing to say to, to that person next to you that, at the work that's going through a divorce. You've got nothing to say to that neighbor that's, that's having conflict with their husband or wife or, or somebody that's going through a problem in the family where the, where the children are not you know, behaving themselves the way they are. You've got nothing to say to somebody in pain because you're ashamed. And you don't see the correlation between the enemy saying, well, don't put all that down. Now, after all, has God said. Has God said to obey? Has God said to be honest? Has God said to be forthright? You bet he has. The Word says it, doesn't it? 
But the enemy always pulls it back off a little bit. And, and you respond a little bit, and you think, well, you know, you know, I ran that red light, but there was, boy, praise the Lord. There was, thank you, Jesus, there was no policeman. Huh? You know that one? Enemy got you right then. The policeman didn't get you, but the enemy got you. And now it comes time a few hours later to witness to somebody, and there's something wrong. There's no energy. There's no unction. There's no anointing because your conscience is disturbed and the shame of sin is upon you. The residue of disobedience and rebellion has been stirred up and, and you're all murky inside. You know what, like stirring up a, uh, a pool or a puddle and the mud's come up in the surface? Well, you're all murky inside because you sinned that little sin that kept you from operating. Now, the devil has done his job. It just kept you off balance a little bit and, and now the power of God can't be manifest in the way it ought to be. Are you hearing me? This is what we've got to learn to do. We've got to learn to live in purity and at peace with God and man, with the government, Caesar, render unto him, and render unto God that that is God's. You and I must learn to live in purity and in piety so that we can be ever ready to be used of God in the works of God, so that our conscience won't deny us. You recognize that one? Isn't that the way the enemy works in your life? It's the way he's worked in mine. Kept me off balance for years, but not anymore. Not anymore. It's time to change, isn't it? Time to walk in holiness with the Lord Jesus Christ and defeat the enemy. Break him down at every point. Take those that have been wrested under his control and take them out of his hand and claim them for the Lord Jesus Christ. Winning the lost, healing the sick. Amen? I've asked Blaine Cook to come up and to pray for Connie tonight. While we were uh, teaching tonight, Blaine had a word of knowledge. Those of you that watch the program on Gifts of the Spirit, you know what that is. That's a picture in your mind or by some revelation you know that something's happening in someone's body. I think in this particular case, Blaine felt it, if I remember right. And he described a condition of pain and asked in the, in the room who had it and Connie responded. And so Blaine is going to begin praying now, actually interviewing and praying and clarifying, and he's going to go through the processes that we talked about last week. While he begins, I'll keep talking to you. If you remember, the first stage is the interview. Now, in this case, because he's had a word of knowledge, he has additional help, help from God. So he already knows how it feels because he feels her pain in his body. That helps, doesn't it, to identify and clarify. Now, he's going to interview with her and make sure that, that there isn't something else more complicated. Because remember, that may not be the only condition she has. And there may be additional information that he can gather in the interview that will help him in the healing process. Now, once he's, he's decided what's wrong, he'll begin, uh, he'll make a decision as to how to pray. And that's what he's doing now. He's giving her some instruction, telling her to relax, and is beginning to pray for her. And you may not be able to see uh, on camera, but I, you can from our angle, that Blaine has his eyes open, but Connie has hers closed. Now, Blaine has his eyes open because he wants to see the effect of his prayer on Connie. Now, you may also not be aware that, that he's praying with a, uh, an understanding, with an unction from God, and as he prays, he's watching the response. And, and can you see the Spirit of God resting on Connie? Some of you can see that, can't you? We've talked about that before, and it's hard to see, isn't it? But basically, what we're talking about is just that sense of, of uh, peace that's over her body. You can see that there's a little flicking of the eyelids. That sometimes that's the autonomic system kicking in, and uh, it's involuntary. It's a little spasming of the, of the muscles. And uh, that often happens when the Spirit of God is resting on someone. Blaine is praying for and speaking specifically and directly to the condition. Remember, we shared that in phase three, as you pray, you're praying prayers according to the leading of God. Well, since God has identified this condition, he can pray that with real authority, can't he? He knows exactly what's wrong, and he knows God wants to heal it. How does he know that? He knows it because he had a word of knowledge. See the advantage of that? Because God has shown him that the con condition is here in the body, he knows God wants to heal it. It's, it's, it's clear revelation. 
for the situation. Now, he's speaking to her, but he's also speaking to the condition. Remember Jesus said, speak to mountains? Well, you, you, it's hard to understand. You know, Jesus went in and, and rebuked the fever of Peter's mother-in-law. You ever talk to a fever? It makes you feel silly. You think, well, does a fever have intelligence? Does a fever have brains? Does it, does it understand? Well, I don't know. All I know is that Jesus did it, and he told us to do it. So sometimes we speak right to pain. We'll say, pain in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Muscles in the name of Jesus, I command you to relax and rest. And you know what happens? Pain goes and muscles re relax. Got it? So here are the stages. Interview, a diagnostic decision, began praying. In the process of prayer, stage four, he's interacting with her. He's asking questions every now and then, moving around her body, praying different things. You notice he started praying on the back and on the neck, and now he's, he's got his hand on the forehead. I, I don't know the reason yet. We haven't had a chance to, to ask any questions. Uh, but the bottom line is that he's doing what he, is coming up as he's praying. So it's sort of an operational procedure. Does that make sense to you? Uh, as you're working with it, uh, there'll be interaction with the person. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to dialogue with them. It's okay to pray uh, with your understanding and also pray with the Spirit giving you guidance. You, remember the cosmic and the empirical? Two realms simultaneously. Okay? We live in two dynamics. We live in constant dynamic tension with this world and the world to come. With both earth and heavenly presence with us with both empirical and cosmic. And so he's interacting between those two planes as he's praying. Now you can see as, as they've been praying, the, the power of God is coming on her stronger and stronger, isn't it? Now this is the work of healing that we're, that we're looking for. This is the evidence of God's engagement upon her body. Now he is, I can hear him, he's rebuking pain right now. He's telling pain to go. And pain's leaving. Isn't that lovely? Now, you notice some things that aren't there. You notice he's not yelling at her. You notice that he's speaking quietly. You notice also, he's, you know, it's not, it's not any big theatrical thing. I mean, we are on the television. But, but it's not some big stage thing. He's just praying out of concern and love for her. This could be accomplished in the corridor. It could happen to, you know, backstage. It could happen any place. You see, the issue of, of uh, ministry to another person is to try to maintain their dignity, try to maintain uh, their freedom, their, their privacy, if you can. And, uh, you know, if it's necessary to stage something like this in order to, to minister, well, that's okay because we're trying to teach you as well as those at home that are watching. And so we're making double use of the experience. But the main thing is that this person's being loved and cared for. You see, it has to be a gentle thing. Remember, the highest commandment of Jesus is love one another. My feeling always is if I pray for somebody and really am gentle and loving with them, that's the most important thing. If I've done that, I've already achieved the highest commandment. And so whether they get well or not, they at least leave my presence feeling loved. You got it? And so minister through the five steps. Ask questions. Diagnose, make a decision as to what kind of prayer, begin praying, dialogue with the person as you do so, and then give some post-prayer suggestions.
Hi, I'm John Wimber from the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Anaheim, California. We're here in the studio today uh, studying healing. Uh, the last few weeks we've been looking at healing as it relates to the kingdom of God and various aspects of it. Today we're going to continue along those lines. So we want to welcome those of you that are viewing with us today and uh, also those that are with us today in the audience. Uh, the topic today, uh, continuing with healing and, and the kingdom of God, is healing as it relates to the forgiveness of sin. In the age to come, God's forgiveness will be full and complete, creating perfect fellowship between man and God. Jeremiah prophesied concerning this in the 31st chapter, verses 33 and 34, when he said this, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, with the coming of the Messiah, the uh, potential for knowing the Lord was, was greatly increased and released as the Lord Jesus Christ came and brought to fruition this prophecy in the New Covenant. And it's this New Covenant that's referred to in many New uh, Testament texts that deals with the whole issue of our ministry and, and that that's been ministered to us and that that we've been blessed with. Jesus has already come then to take away sin by the initiation of this new covenant in his blood. And in 1 John, the third chapter, fifth verse, it says this, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So the Lord Jesus Christ came as the Son of God incarnate, became a human being, and lived the perfect life, uh, resulting ultimately in his arrest, his uh, mock trial, his death on the cross, uh, providing for you and I a, a, the potential and the reality in which we can know the forgiveness of sin and enter into relationship with Him, the, the very relationship that He had with the Father before the world was begun. And in, in so doing, you and I uh, today, by faith, can enter into that same relationship and know the forgiveness of our sin. Therefore, forgiveness is a gift. And with it comes the righteousness of God, which makes us acceptable. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 21, Paul writes and says this about this righteousness. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the very righteousness of God. So Jesus Christ has provided us the righteousness of God. In him we have righteousness. Outside of him we have none, but in him we have it. In 1 John, uh, the uh, gospel writer John writes that uh, in him was the life, and in, in, in that relationship with him, we have life. And outside of him, we don't have any life. And so this life is the life of righteousness, the life of Christ that you and I have, have entered into, having been joined together in one body through the shed blood of Jesus. We've, been, we've come to a place where we've set aside the old life, the old man, the old nature, and entered into the new life, in Christ Jesus, in which sin has been forgiven us. This brings release and healing to all dimensions affected by sin. The spirit, the conscience, the mind, emotions, the body, interpersonal relationships. In fact, every aspect of human existence is affected by forgiveness of sin. When God makes real to you the forgiveness of sin that He has provided through the Lord Jesus Christ, it affects every aspect of your existence. There's nothing that's not affected. Having come into the realization that our sins have been forgiven us, we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. And in that new creation in Christ Jesus, we are, it affects every aspect of our human existence. This brings the release of healing to all these dimensions. And uh, we have several scriptures that deal with this kinds of issue. Uh, for instance, the lame man in Mark 2, uh, verse 5 through 12, you, you see that there's a relationship between sin and sickness. Uh, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Now they were operating under good theology. They understood that only God can forgive sins, and the text goes on to say that. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Of course, their problem was that they didn't recognize it was God that was forgiving the sin. Jesus, the Son of God, had come 
for the very purpose. And so he looked at a man and he saw the relationship between a physical condition and the need for forgiveness. Evidently, there was a correlation here. He had had some sort of a sin life that had produced this paralysis. And so Jesus, looking at him, said, your sins are forgiven you. And the, those, are, those that were watching, they were really perturbed with this. And the scripture goes on to say, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, uh, why, think, uh, why are you thinking of these things? Which is easier to say, uh, your sins are forgiven, or to get up and take your bed and walk. Now, of course, they couldn't say either one. They, they were prohibited by the law in forgiving sins. They understood that only uh, God could forgive sins, and they were prohibited by limitations, uh, human limitations, f for healing. Them. And so Jesus is putting a proposition to them that, in which they're bound on both regards. Their theology binds them in one, one aspect, and their human limitations binds them in the other aspect. And so he demonstrates that he's not bind, bound by either, by turning and looking at the man and saying, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Can you see the relationship here? You see, we demonstrate, or Jesus in this case, demonstrates the authority to forgive sin by healing the physical. Can you see how that's interrelated? Inter healing, then, and forgiveness are intertwined in this text. Jesus is showing that he has authority on earth to forgive the invisible by healing the visible. Can you see it? That that they can measure is being touched so that 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 they can't measure, that, that they can have faith for believing that 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 they can't measure is being touched also. The forgiveness of sin and the healing of the sick here is tied together. He said to the par paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up and took his mat and walked out on the, in full view of them all. And the people had their doors blown off. That's what amazed means in my translation. <laughs> this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this before where men get up from their beds and walk. They, can't, they were paralyzed just a few seconds before. Now, people ever since have been saying that. Throughout the church age, there has been this kind of thing happening. Oh, I know that there are many today that would, would deny this. But uh, and I believe they're sincere and godly people that, that, that do not believe that this has occurred. But I believe, and have uh, even written to the issue, that it has occurred. We've done research on it. And we've come to a place where we recognize that this sort of thing has happened. My encouragement to you is to believe, having not seen. Another text that illustrates the same dynamic, and, and that is to say the relationship between forgiveness of sin and sickness, is the story that's found in Luke 7, 47 through 50, the story of the street woman, in which we see emotional and social healing realized through forgiveness. Let me pick up with the text in verse 47. Therefore I tell you, uh, Jesus speaking, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who can even forgive sin? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So here we see a pronouncement. Remember we talked about that earlier when we talked about prayer, certain kinds of prayer that can come? Well, Jesus just pronounced this woman um, forgiven as well as healed. And you and I had that same privilege. There's a story of the paralyzed man, remember, in John 5, uh, verses 1 through 15. Jesus told him to stop sinning or something worse might happen to him. This is the story of the, uh, the pool of Bethesda healing. John brings a balance to this kind of teaching when, uh, with the man born blind that's referenced in the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 7. And here he says that he shows this man's blindness was not caused by his or his parents' sin, but was just an occasion for the glory of God. And by that I mean this circumstance had developed. The man was blind from birth, but Jesus happened through, and providentially, and healed the man. So the occasion was just an opportunity for God to show his glory and his blessing. So there can be uh, sin-related sickness, and there can be sickness that's not related to sin at all. Of course, it's generally related to sin because there'd be no sickness in the world if there weren't sin. God didn't intend for there to be any sickness. 
But as a result of Adam's fall, there has been sickness in the world. But what we're talking about is the difference between specifically related sin and sickness as contrasted with generally related. God wants us to live in good health. Uh, I think the health is the, is the gift uh, of God by seeing to it that we're continually free from guilt and condemnation, uh, problems with the feelings of inferiority and unworthiness, um, the feelings of, and the, the difficulties of, that unforgiveness and, and resentment and hate can bring about. All of these things have been provided for in the, in the concept and in the dynamic of forgiveness. If we go to God and receive forgiveness uh, for our sin, we can be relieved of many physical problems that are directly related to the lack of that. If we haven't uh, made use of uh, God's provision for forgiveness, many of us go around with sickness in our body. Christians go around with sickness in their body because of hidden anger and resentments and ill feelings and sins that they're committing on a regular basis that prohibits them from staying healthy. And so the body of Christ today has uh, con resisted uh, to some degree the teaching of the Word as it relates to these things. And as a result, many are sick today in the body that needn't be, that just simply needn't be if they would pay better attention to what God's provided through confession of sin and forgiveness. Now keep in mind that all of this is done by actively believing in God's gift of forgiveness and righteousness, overcoming the accuser of the brethren and by forgiving others. We have many texts that support this, but you may want to look up at a later point, Revelation 12, 11, and Matthew 8, 15 through 35. Now, I want to deal with another aspect of, of healing today that relates to what we call healing as restoration from sickness. Isaiah says that when God comes with vengeance to save us, the lame will leap and eyes will open and ears will hear and the dumb will speak. He prophesies this in Isaiah 35, verses 3 through 6. And it goes like this. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance and with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then will the lame leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Of course, this was fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came with both compassion and anger, with both word and works, to provide the very healing that was prophesied by many of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah included. Now, the underlying dynamic here is that Jesus had come to both do as well as teach the reality of the kingdom. And what we've missed today is we've become preoccupied. I'm talking about we generally in the church today. We've become preoccupied with the study of the word, which is a good thing, to the exclusion of working out the works. And Jesus said on numerous occasions in different kinds of settings that there's a correlation between that that he did and that that he said. And we somehow have missed that correlation. We've missed the importance of works. Uh, you know, I, as a result of the Reformation, we've got a, a strongly entrenched idea that, that we're saved and, uh, without works. And that's, it's, that's good theology. Jesus Christ has provided salvation as a free gift. But we've forgotten that we've been saved unto good works. And these works are the works of warring between two kingdoms. You and I have been called then by the Lord Jesus Christ to do the work of the kingdom, to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to minister to the poor, to preach the gospel, to win the lost, to set the captives free, to, in Jesus' name, feed and care for those that need feeding and care for. This is the work of the kingdom. Somehow in the church today, we become so focused on, on church life you know, attendance, committee work, and involvement in, in the church, uh, doing the things that, that keep the institution going, that we forgot the Bible life. In the Word, you know, the apostles were called to an active participation in daily ministry. Do you realize that? They never had any committee meetings. At least it's not recorded in Scripture, not the, uh, that I can see. Oh, there, there were councils a, a few times, but I'm talking about the ongoing daily kind of life that we know in the institution today. They were called to an active participation 
in doing the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus' ministry is clearly stated in the Gospels. He went about doing good, didn't he? Healing the sick and preaching the gospel and teaching the things of the kingdom and ministering to the hungry. You know, I like that part, don't you? The feeding the hungry. I always like that part, especially around dinner time. Jesus, Jesus then did the works of the Father in the world. And, and it was these works that, that, frankly, that were broadcast in the land. People said, come and hear this man. More importantly, come and see this man and what he does. And so the words and the works of Jesus were intertwined. And I believe that, that therein is one of the great problems today we have in the church. We've missed the importance of the works of Jesus. I, part of it's our advancing secularization uh, in the church. You know, we, we've come to a place under the scientific age where we hardly believe anything in the realm of the supernatural. We have difficulty. You know, there are many that fight and argue and hassle over whether there ever were any of these marvelous miracles that are recorded in Scripture. Of course, we that believe the Word would attest to the fact that they did happen. But even those that believe the Word, many of them don't believe they happen today. Somehow they think that God lost His energy, you know, back there. That He did it once and it's no longer necessary. Now that we have the written Word, we no longer need the testimony of works. I don't think that's valid. Especially when I'm sick. I don't think it's valid. Especially when I need the works of God, I don't think it's valid. I think we need everything that they got. Don't you? I think we need it all. I think we need Jesus to be just like he was then, today. Oh, I don't know that we need any more of the written word. We've got enough a truth, I think, to, to work with. But what we haven't gotten is let the truth get a hold of us in such a way as we act it out in obedience every day. You know what I think? I think it's time that we quit analyzing this book and started obeying it. I think today that we've become a, a, a generation of uh, analysts. You know, we, we're, we're preoccupied with dissecting it and, and comparing this section to that section, and we've, we've become so involved with, uh, with thinking about it and talking about it that we never do any of it. And I think that Jesus had in mind that we'd become a lot more practical than we've been. I think going next door and helping a guy fix his car is every bit as important as sitting home studying the Word. Many don't believe that, huh? Oh, I think that we, have, we ought to study the Word, and we have to study the Word, and without that, we'd be in great and dire need. But I'm saying that there comes a point in time where you've got to act on the Word. Helping that neighbor with his car may be the basis for sharing God's love in the only practical way that he'll let you express it. Going next door and taking care of a sick mother and her baby may be the most practical thing you can do for referencing God to that person. My encouragement to you is that you look for practical ways to express your works, I mean your belief. James said that, that uh, he has faith with works. And everybody got mad at James including Martin Luther. But I want to tell you something. I think James was very practical. He was just a good old pastor, and he was saying, hey, let's get with it. It's not enough to read it, folks, and study it. We have to come to grips with doing it. You see, that's what our communities are looking for today. That's what the people are looking for in our communities, I should say. They're looking for a, a God that can be reached and touched. And you and I can in the name of Jesus touch those around us and demonstrate forgiveness and demonstrate healing and demonstrate the work of the kingdom. And this is what we've been called to. And this is what's missing today in so much of our thinking about Christ. It's not enough to go to church. We've got to take church to the community. We've got to take Jesus to a lost and dying generation, demonstrating once and for all that he's Lord. He's Lord over all of it, isn't he? He's Lord over unemployment. He's Lord over sickness. He's Lord over divorce. He's Lord over all of these kinds of things that are causing so much pain and difficulty in our society today. And we need to show the world that. You agree?
We've been talking here in the studio today about forgiveness and the power of forgiveness and the actualization of forgiveness and how that relates to, to ministry and the ministry of God to us as well as our ministry to others. And so I wanted to take a moment and to talk to some of you about your experience of the forgiveness of sin. What, what happened to you? Maybe we can start at, at conversion and talk about what happened to you at conversion and the, the realization of, of knowing that you were forgiven and what that meant to you. And I, while during the break, I asked Russell if he would talk to me a moment about it. Russ, will you come up here? Will you tell everybody your name? Russ Nelson. Russ Nelson. And I remember back a number of years ago, Russ, when you were converted. I think you owned a garage or something at that time, didn't you? Yeah. And, but since then, you've, you've changed employment? Yeah. At, at the time, I was involved in a work that I, I didn't care for. In fact, I hated, but I, <laughs> I, I couldn't see myself getting out of it. And about that time, a friend started sharing the Lord with me, and uh, I, I didn't have much faith that it was going to work, but I didn't have nothing else to go for, so uh -huh. I, I tried it. Now, you weren't raised in the church? No. And how old were you then when this guy began sharing with you? About 28. About 28. And how did he, what did he tell you about this business of forgiveness? The thing that bothered me about him was he, he was demonstrating it to me, and, and there was a love that came through from him, and it showed in him like it didn't show in other people, and it, it, it bothered me because I, I, I couldn't understand what it was, and it just drew me. Well, you're demonstrating love, what do you mean? You, he was friendly to you? He was accepting of you? What? He was, he was genuine. He, he just he accepted me, and he, and he would just be there to share with me whenever I needed to talk to someone. Huh. Hang around a lot, did he? Yeah, always at the right times. <laughs> <laughs> what did he tell you about God? that God really loved me. And, and it was a hard thing for me to grasp because I, at that time I couldn't envision anybody loving me. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You were struggling with feelings of inferiority and maybe yeah. of, of just turmoil inside. Uh, no contentment at all. Just, just mm -hmm. constant turmoil. When did this all come to a, a head, a climax? The Lord brought me to a point where I, I continually fought him because I, I believed I could do it on my own. And, and he let me come to a point of just being broken. And you mean do it on your own? Live life on your own? Yeah, that I could, that I could resolve my own conflicts. Mm. And, and he just let me go to the wall to where I was flat on my back. Is that right? Yeah. And, and then he stepped in and, and showed me his love. How did he do that? It, at first, I, I wasn't too sure of what was going on. But it was, it was like there was a transition, a change that began to take place. And, and this brother that shared with me, he would tell me to just give it a chance to just let the Lord minister for a while, that I'd done it for a while and that it, now it was his turn. And, and all of a sudden I began to realize that there was things going on. My, my attitudes were changing. My, my feelings about people were changing. Hmm. And, and it, it seemed the faster it went, the, the more I was unaware of exactly what was going on, other than that there was change going on. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a moment of time where you actually stepped over from from not believing to believing? Yeah, I, I, there was one time that I was going to a breakfast with this brother, and, and the presence of the Lord just came on me, and I started weeping. And, and I think that was one of the first times that I really felt his love, and, and I just couldn't handle it. It was just something that I was totally unfamiliar with, and it was just so strong, and it was so, so soft and yet so strong. Hmm. Did you pray or something? The first time I prayed, it, it, was, it was almost like I tried to offer the Lord a deal. <laughs> I think a lot of us have done that, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, and, and the first time I prayed, I, I didn't feel anything happen. And I remember looking at this brother and saying, it didn't work. And, and he just laughed like you just did. <laughs> and so this uh, on this other occasion, did you pray also? Yeah. Uh, I, I just began to talk to the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and he just began to move. What did for feelings of forgiveness, what did forgiveness feel like? just waves of release. It, it was like weights were being lifted. Mm -hmm. and, and each time it became stronger, more weight was lifted. And, and I began to feel just a freedom beyond anything I'd ever experienced. Mm -hmm. What were tangible ways that you could measure that you were forgiven? The sense of being loved. I, uh, I, I didn't have any place to put that. The, the feelings of love that I began to experience and my feelings toward other people, to, to begin to care about other people because I, I was very cold. I, I had isolated myself in an attempt to control myself. Hmm. Was there any one scripture that God used in that process? One scripture in particular was about greater love hath no man than to give his life for his brother. Hmm. 
And, and that scripture really became real to me. And you saw that Jesus had done that. Yeah. It was, it was a process where I suddenly began to realize that he really did die for me. And, and that his love was real and it was there. And all I had to do was just receive it. God bless you, man. That sounds great. Thanks for sharing with us. You can be seated. Now, you see how it works? The forgiveness comes packaged in people, doesn't it? Somebody loved Russ and pressed in on him and demonstrated love, showed love toward him, hung around, you know, was there when he, when he wanted to talk and probably there when he didn't want to talk, you know, for a while. And continued to, to uh, express that the source of his care came from God. And so that Russ couldn't mistake it as, as something human, that it was coming from God. And, and Russ, like many of us, uh, were, uh, were reluctant to receive that love, to receive that forgiveness, and yet wanted it. And we tried to bargain with God. Did you catch that part? You know, that he offered God his own deal. But you see, there's only one deal that can be made here, and that's God's deal. And God's deal is that you and I have sinned. We've been born unto sin. And that we need to be forgiven of that sin so that we can have relationship with him. Because in the sin, we've been parted from him, separated from him, born separated from God. And that God has provided through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, the potential for you and I being reunited with God, brought into relationship with him. And that's what forgiveness is all about. That realization that you and I have become one with God. We've entered into a relationship that Jesus had with the Father before the world was formed. Now, out of the context of that, having received love from God, Russ began loving others. Isn't that what happened to you? I'm John Wimber from the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Anaheim, California. I want to welcome you with, to here today to the studio and to our teaching session on healing for today. In the past few weeks, we've been studying the topic of healing as it relates to the kingdom of God, and we've been looking at it from various aspects. And today we're going to continue in that process by looking at two additional aspects that we haven't looked at before. The first one is, is relates to healing as life from death. You know, eternal life will be the life of the, of the age to come with the total removal of death. Therefore, death is seen as man's enemy and life everlasting is a future possession. John, the gospel writer in the book of Revelation, verse, chapter 21, verse 4, says this, He will wipe away tears from their eyes and there will be no more death nor mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And so saying, John is declaring the reality there will be a time in which there will be no more death. Death will have been removed from the, uh, the potential for any of us in, our, in, that, in that existence at that time. In Jesus, death at this time has been overcome and eternal life has become a present possession for all that receive Jesus. In John, the fifth chapter, the same writer under the same unction of the Holy Spirit writes this in the 24th verse. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So receiving Christ gives us the, the passage, the permission to uh, enter into eternal life in this 
present condition. Now, there's another one of those situations where we have two dynamics at the same time. Though we are very much caught up in the reality that we're in this body, in this present age, in this earth's condition, and this body is decaying. I don't know about yours, but mine's decaying pretty rapidly. And we're in the process of decline. And I'm moving towards the death of this vessel. But at the same time, I'm caught up in, and swept up in another reality, and that's that I've already entered into, by virtue of my born-again experience, into the life everlasting. So I'm enjoying two lives, the life that is declining and the life that's inclining, the life that's, that's disappearing in this vessel, in this body, and the life that's increasing and growing in Christ Jesus. And that reality and that life is an ever-increasing dynamic that... Uh, I like to share it with everybody that I get a chance to share it with. The gift, then, of eternal life is healing in the sense of a resurrection from spiritual death. Your spirit is born from above with kingdom life, and it becomes one with God's spirit. Now, Paul picks up this theme in Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 6, when he says this, As for you, the reader, the people at Ephesus, you were dead in your transgressions and sin." Now he's saying in time past, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So he's referencing the fact that there was a time in which they weren't in the kingdom of God. They were under the kingdom of the prince of the power of the air. But he goes on to say, in contrast, all of us who lived among them at, at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature object of uh, wrath. But because of his great love for us, and I, I always think of, remember when I was a kid, I used to listen to the Lone Ranger. And every time I read this statement, I, I don't know why, you know, I'm crazy. I always hear that, that anthem, dun, 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 you know, that, that, the thing that the Lone Ranger, because that's what the Lord did, you see. Just in the nick of time, Jesus came. Now notice this. But, see, here's this dreadful condition. By nature, we're children of wrath. We're caught in disobedience and transgression and sin. We're destined to eternal life in hell, separated from God. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace, then, that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? I love that part. We ought, to, we ought to have trumpets blasting and drums rolling when we, when we read that text. You see, there's a time in the future when God, as it were, will, will take you by the hand as a child and lead you through all of eternity, just you and he. You know, when you get to heaven, you won't have to, uh, you know, have a name tag. You know, I'm John from Anaheim, because he knows my name. We have relationship. I've entered into that reality in which... Today I know Jesus. Today I'm involved in eternal life. And you are too. And so we're known unto him and he to us. But there'll be a time in the future in which we will, the full expression of that will take place. Now we know in part, but then we're going to know much more fully. Now, another aspect of this is that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead opens the way for our bodily resurrection. You see, he not only died to save our souls, but he also is going, has provided for our bodies. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead opens the way for our bodily resurrection at the consummation of the kingdom of God. Therefore, the resurrection of the body is the ultimate healing for all of God's people. Now, Paul picks up this theme in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and I want to refer you to verse 35 in that chapter. Paul writing says this, But someone may ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Remember, he's speaking to an agrarian culture, and they understand this kind of concept. When you sow... You do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. 
all flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, and animals have another, and birds have another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, and the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ from stars in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. This body is perishable. It'll be sown into the ground. As it's sown, it'll be raised in a new substance, in a new reality. So he goes on to say, the body that is sown is perishable, and it's raised imperishable. It, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it's raised a spiritual body. Now, you know, today, with our understanding of, uh, you know, as a result of the, uh, the probes out in space, we know that this natural body can't live in space without help. Remember the moon probes a few years ago? And more recent times, uh, some of the other kinds of uh, activity in, the, in space? Well, along the, um, you know, since the mid-50s when we started all this type of thing, Along the way, we've discovered some uh, things about living in space. And you and I know that without support, this body can't function out there. Well, this body can't function in heaven any more than it can in space. This body is sown to dishonor. This body must perish so that that new body will be released. This one has to go in order for us to go to heaven. And so we can't take an earthly body to heaven. We have to take a heavenly Even Jesus had to have a heavenly body before he went to heaven. He had already been resurrected. He had already been changed, I mean, substantially. And so that body that, that ascended up from Mount of Olives that day was a heavenly body. It had some peculiar properties to it. Remember the, that he appeared and disappeared? He, at one time he appeared in a room and then he went outside the room. Uh, evidently, according to the Gospels, he was in several places at once. Try that one sometime. <laughs> you know? Uh, we know that he ate. At least one morning he ate with the apostles. They all had fish together. Uh, so there's some similarities between that heavenly body and this earthly body, but the bottom line is you can't go to heaven with this body. We've got to get rid of it. It's got to go. But this body changed is going to go to heaven. And so God values your body, but he's going to change it instantly. And the, and the scripture goes on to declare that. And it's a rather lengthy passage, and I'd refer it to you at, for another time of study. The most important thing I'm trying to say simply is this, that God has provided in his plan of salvation for the, for the total salvation of you, all of you, body, soul, and spirit. He wants all of you. The raising of a dead person like Lazarus and many others is a sign of death's defeat and the anticipation of the victory of the resurrection at the end of the age. Therefore, we should expect as part of our healing to raise the dead as and when God directs. Now, I've been talking on this theme for a number of years, and I've developed a number of theories on resuscitation, raising of the dead. And um, I, I've even talked to a couple of people that have been used by God in the raising of the dead and check my theories out then. They said, yeah, that's the way it works. And so I've been going about the land and around the country, you know, looking for an opportunity to raise the dead. And every time I speak, I always ask if there are any volunteers. <laughs> and uh, to date, I haven't found anyone very enthusiastic, uh, you know, to, to go through this exercise with me. But I suspect that there'll be a point in time between now and, and sometime in the future that I'll get an opportunity to do that. That'll look good on your record, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have that one on your record when you're before the Lord Jesus, that you were used to raise the dead? Of course, he did the work, and you just participated in it, but gosh, I'd like to do that once or twice or maybe even three times between now and eternity. Let me whisper a secret to you people. I'm playing with this and, and communicating it in humor, but I'm going to tell you something that's really I'm deadly serious about. This is the only time in all of eternity that you'll be able to trust Jesus for anything. You see, on the other side of this life, there's no place to trust him. You're with him. There's nothing to believe him for. It's all done. This is the only time in all of eternity that you can believe Jesus for anything. Because when you're in his presence, 
it'll all be revealed. It'll all be done. So if you're ever going to believe, and if you're ever going to act on it, now's the time. Got it? Everybody go like that. All right. Now, the second thing that I want to address today is the issue of healing as sharing God's abundance with the oppressed poor. Remember, Jesus declared himself to have come under the unction of the Holy Spirit for the ministry to the poor. And the word, the concept, in the New and the Old Testament that's most often translated poor really means poor as a result of oppression. Now, who's the oppressor of, of people? Satan. We've been learning that. And his kingdom. Now, does he use people? Yes. Does he use economies? Yes. Does he use regimes? Yes. All of those things are true. But the bottom line is that, that people that are poor as a result of the oppression of economy, it could be ethnic, it can be... It, it, there's all kinds of different ways in which mankind oppresses mankind. But behind the, the oppressor is the oppressor, Satan himself. He's causing this to be done. And so the, our ultimate goal is to remove his presence from those that are being used to oppress. And so our, our activity has to be more than political. It has to be spiritual. Because we're dealing with spiritual war here. And we must come against the work of the enemy that would cause people to be living under oppression. Now, let's review some basic things about this business of the oppressed poor. First of all, God's abundance is fully revealed and shared by all in the kingdom of God. This is referenced in many texts, but I just want to look at one. Isaiah 25, 6, it says this, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. If it says all, how many does that mean? All. A banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Now the Lord sets a good table. And his preparation is for all of mankind. Poverty and hunger and dire need are part of the curse of this present evil age. They're the result of the fall. And in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, the text says to Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Though pain, through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So as a result of sin, the sin of man, all that was under the dominion of man is also cursed. Not only the creature, but the creation. So the whole of creation, Paul says, groans in travail, waiting for the revelation, the ultimate freeing of itself in the work of Christ. Just as we are waiting for that day, so is the rest of creation. So is the animal kingdom. Everything is under travail, under the curse. Jesus came preaching good news to the oppressed poor, that they might seek and experience the kingdom of God, and what they needed would be given to them. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, uh, the fifth verse, and then later in the sixth chapter, the 33rd verse, it says this concerning it. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and wrote, the good news is preached to the poor. What's the good news? The oppressor's power has been broken. The oppressor's power has been broken. Healing is yours, salvation is yours, and economic help is yours. In the 6th chapter, the 33rd verse, he says, But seek ye first his kingdom. Does that have a new meaning to you now, this text? Seeking the kingdom of God is seeking the manifest presence of God in the world. Righting the wrongs of this world. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Can you see the promise now? The promise is for redemption on every level. Physical redemption, emotional, social redemption. All that's under the oppressor's hand will be redeemed in Christ's name. God's reign breaks the power of poverty in the lives of men and women, teaching them to give to others in need. 
For instance, in Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 27 through 38, uh, we have this reference. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if someone strikes you on one cheek, uh, turn to him the other also. And if someone takes your cloak, do not stay, uh, stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And, the, and it goes on to, uh, along these lines, teaching some basic concepts of how we're to interact with the evil of this world and how we're to operate in the context of the kingdom and in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ when we come into contact with travail and difficulty. Now, the last point that I want to make on this whole business of uh, the oppressed force is this. The as this aspect of healing in the kingdom, and I'm talking about healing, the work of God's the force of God's love and mercy in the world. This aspect of healing in the kingdom, which affects men and man and his environment, uh, has been technically called redemption and lift. Now, this is a term coined by Dr. Donald McGavern uh, of Fuller Seminary uh, and School of World Missions, uh, where I've worked as an adjunct professor for years. And it needs a further explanatory note so that we can, for clarity's sake, grasp it. Now, keep, the, keep in mind the fundamental concept. Jesus Christ frees us from the curse of the law. This is declared in Galatians 3.13, and it says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Now, when that gospel is preached, you've been delivered from the curse. You're under the kingdom. There is an impact both socially as well as spiritually. It changes man and his environment. Poverty is the result of oppression. Lack of poverty is the result of the mercy of God, the change in the impoverished condition. The purpose of God, therefore, is to heal us from the oppression of a, po of a poverty uh, mentality as well as a poverty reality, freeing us to enjoy and share God's abundance with others. Abundance or prosperity is being free to give, being able to meet any need through God's resources. It does not mean the, the hoarding of the, of the wealth of the world like the world's rich does. It means the giving of God's blessing to others. So God will increase your potential to bless others by increasing your potential, by giving you more. But the issue is not to give to get to give, to, to keep, <laughs> excuse me, it's to give to get to give. There are those that are preach a doctrine today that says, give to get. Well, that's short-sighted and incomplete. There's no question that if you sow, you will reap. And I'd encourage you to do that. It's been my practice for years, and God has blessed me with abundance. On the other hand, that abundance is for a purpose. What is that purpose? To bless others. And so you give to get to give. Got it? Just like seed in your garden. If you want plants, you've got to put the seed in the ground. Well, you've got to risk it. Oh, my seed's gone. Where is it? Well, it's in the ground. Well, what's it doing in there? I don't know. I, later on, it, through gestation, it, it busts, bursts forth and comes out the ground. And now you have a plant. And then the plant is a multiplicity of seed, a plethora, a multiplication of it. Now I have the plant and its fruit as well as seed, more seed. See how it works? We need both. So in nature, we have this reflection. And in the scripture, we have this understanding that we are to give, to get, to give. And so there is a reality, McGavin has shown that there's a reality where that this gospel is preached, the economic condition of that culture, that community, that people changes over a period of time. It's measurable. It's measurable. It's good sense to come to Christ. It's good sense to come under the teaching of scripture it's valid it'll change your place it'll change your nation it'll change your community people who have heretofore lived in for, for generations in, in in poverty come to christ and the poverty chain is broken and god begins enriching and encouraging and blessing and taking care of them and as they come under the discipline of scripture and begin doing the things that god extols and encourages out of that comes riches and blessings I don't mean that we'll all be rich as Solomon, but we'll all be better off for having come to Jesus. You can expect God to prosper you. You can expect God to bless you. It's his nature, and it's the way his program works. 
And so where we have an opportunity to sow this teaching, we will see people's economic condition changed. You got it? There is a measurable increase and in blessing for those that come to Christ. So we've been given the weapons of warfare. And the first weapon, of course, is the Word itself. Teach this teaching and lead people into prosperity for the sake of the gospel, that they, as they prosper, they'll have the wherewithal to do good deeds, to bless others, to care for others, to give out of their blessing generously to the needs of others. That's God's plan. Go for it. We've been talking today about the blessing of God. We actually talked about two different themes, but the main theme that I want to take a few moments on to, to readdress and continue to address is the theme of God's blessing and prosperity. Now, this is an area that's been, I think, almost overtaught in the, in the church today, but in some corners of the church it hasn't been taught really at all. And all I want to do by taking these last few moments of our program is to emphasize the importance of understanding that the blessing and the providence of God is not for your personal wealth. You see, God has a program in the world. The program is uh, directly related to the commission that Jesus gave the church. We are to win the lost, to go about the land preaching this gospel of the kingdom, and then shall the end come. What is the nature of this gospel that's referred to? Like the, the text I'm quoting from, of course, is Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the ends of the earth, to all people, and then shall the end come. Well, what is this gospel of the kingdom? Well, that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks. The gospel of healing, the gospel of blessing, the gospel of care. The gospel that, that changes the environment of people. The gospel that releases those that are impoverished and, and gives them potential. You know, uh, many times the church, in the, in, the, in the throes of wanting to do good, runs out to the community and tries to find those that have need and, and gives them a temporary fix, a, a handout. I want to tell you something. I grew up in poverty. I grew up in very, very impoverished conditions. I don't want to paint it too dark, but uh, believe me, I know what poverty is. I grew up where it was really difficult to know what you're going to eat sometimes, much of the time. And I would have resented someone coming along and giving me a sandwich. What I wanted, I remember the day that I went home to my mother and said, Mom, the, the kid down the street says we're poor. And my mother was incensed. She said, we're not poor, we just don't have money. And I said, well, what, is, what does it mean? And she said, honey, poor is a state of mind. Now, my mother at that time didn't know the Lord. Of course, later on she came to know Him. But she had a grasp of the issue right then. You see, when a person from the inside out is changed, it gives them a new state of mind. That's what happens in Christ. And poverty, poverty mentality, dissipates. Now, what I wanted as a child was an opportunity to get out. I didn't want a handout. I wanted a hand, a helping hand. My father wanted that. My mother wanted that. They wanted a job where they could earn a, a living. They wanted a way out of the ghetto kind of life that we lived. And we got it. And we came out here to California and prospered. God blessed us. But the greatest prosperity that happened to us out here in California, came from the Midwest, was when we came to know Jesus. Because then we had prosperity of soul and spirit. And out of that has come an abundance for good deeds. Oh, I don't mean to imply that we're super wealthy in this world's goods, but we've had enough to meet the needs of others for years now. And I tell you, it is much more blessed to give than to receive. So the goal of your prosperity thinking has to be to come into the abundance of giving. And it begins where you're impoverished. You begin by planting that that you can't afford to plant, giving that you can't afford to give. Out of that comes the God's increase and in blessing. Don't wait to get a lot to give. You'll never do it. 